We are here with professors uh, John Stoke and Rob Martello from the Allen College of Engineering, who are at Universidad Francisco Marroquín and have been conducting a workshop on project-based learning over the past couple of days. So welcome to Universidad Francisco Marroquín. And we'd probably start with a very basic question on the nature and what is uh, project-based learning? It's a great question sure. to start with. <laughs> Rob, would you like to take that one? <laughs> I would be delighted to. So, so we, we gave a workshop here on project-based learning, looking at a different teaching technique involving the use of many different potential goals, hands-on experiences in the classroom, potential integration of disciplines. Um, basically, the idea is to make the classroom more of an active location of learning, uh, trying to be, engage students more in the learning process through a variety of techniques, and as I was saying before, for a variety of possible goals. Yeah, we'd like to think of project-based learning as not a prescribed pedagogical approach, but something that is incredibly flexible, very broad, and really something that can be shaped to the goals of a particular course, uh, to the goals of students, to the goals of, of an instructor. Now, John, from my understanding that you're an engineer, uh, Rob, you're a historian, and uh, yet you uh, collaborate on a uh, joint uh, course involving engineering and involving history. Would you tell us a little bit about this? Sure. sure. Um, maybe we should tell the story of how the course initially got um, created that's or a, the idea for the course. That's a great idea. Um, yeah. So just briefly, uh, Rob and I started at Olin College of Engineering uh, at the same time, actually on the same day. And uh, we met each other in uh, our faculty meeting. It was actually an orientation for, the, for the, the old faculty to meet the new faculty, for the new faculty to learn a little bit about Olin. So uh, we sat next to each other, much like we are right here. And uh, I introduced myself to Rob. And uh, he said his name. And I said, oh, you must be the Paul Revere guy. That's my historical topic. So that we had read little bios, biographies of one another. And I said, oh, yes, John, oh, I believe you said material science. Is that right? You work with metals. I study someone who works with metals. So we shook hands. We, we, thought, each, we thought it was a friendly exchange and talked for a minute or two. And at the end of that, I, I believe one of us said, gee, wouldn't it be fun if we could work together someday, if we could teach a course or something like that? And we both laughed because it really seemed like a joke at the time. It was just sort of such an impossible thought, you know, materials, history, why would those fit together? We laughed, we moved on with orientation, things moved on. As time passed though, we started to learn more about each other's learning approach, about the goals that we tried to achieve. We realized it didn't have to be a joke. Right, and uh, one of the things that helped a lot was that Olin College as an institution early on said it wanted to do things that were bold and innovative in engineering education. But it didn't, really, uh, it didn't really define what that meant. So we were able to try all sorts of different experiments. So uh, at some point, we realized we could actually try integrating history with material science. And we thought, what better way than to try to create a project-based course where students are working on projects where they study technology, but in the broader human context or societal context, uh, both from a historical perspective and also eventually looking to the future. So kind of predicting what, um, uh, what history will be um, t 20 years out or 100 years out. And we figured that the approaches of the two disciplines would work well together for the students uh, to create a very informative, a well-rounded, high motivation experience. In other words, you could use history to suggest topics within material science. You could say, let's look at something of historical importance, and then you could use the material science to dig into that historical question and really evoke some of the complicated connections and really go deeper into the, the technology you're studying. And you could do it the other way around as well. You could use material science to suggest an interesting historical question. So as the course developed, we found more and more of these topics where we could really work together, um, similar, again, similar um, uh, disciplinary interests, or, or, you know, combined disciplinary interests. But we also had a similar teaching style, I think, was a big part of why we enjoy working together. So could you give us a, like an example? Uh, I understand uh, that in uh, this particular course that you've designed called The Stuff of History, uh, the point of departure is an object. That's right. Uh, 
Could you give us an example and tell us about that? Sure. Um, when we first sat down to, to design the course, Rob and I looked at each other's background. We looked at each other's interests. We looked at what we wanted uh, out of, in terms of goals for students. And we attempted to make as many connections as we possibly could. So I would say, well, in, in introductory material science, students learn about atoms, ions, and molecules. They learn about properties like mechanical properties or electrical properties or thermal properties of materials. They look at microstructure. They might do some processing. And, uh, and Rob gave me his list of, of things from history of technology. That's right. I was just thinking about technologies in the societal context. So how could a technology emerge from the needs or opportunities of a, of a group of people? And in return, how does that technology shape the society? And so when John was describing properties, saying that it's nice to start a material science course with a look at properties, why is this hard? Why is something else soft or malleable? I was saying, I like to start the history of technology courses early, uh, ancient civilizations where possible, it lets you really look backwards and sort of look at a very different context from our own and use that as a lens for studying the technologies. So we said, what better you know, opportunity for a first pro project than choosing an object in an ancient society and using that object to explore why the society functions the way it does. Why, who would make that object? Who would use it? What impacts does it have? Economic impacts, environmental impacts, maybe some political um, repercussions of the, of the object. And I think it was at some point we decided, well, if we're looking at the ancient object, we could actually compare that ancient technology to a modern day technology. And one of the things that we think works really well in the ancient to modern uh, connection is um, ancient civilizations did a lot of things with technology. They developed new materials, they processed those materials. Um, they were going for certain performance of the things that they made. They didn't necessarily understand things like microstructure of materials. They didn't understand atoms and ions and molecules. And we said, well, if you just pick some, uh, you grab someone off the street today and you hand them a, uh, an object, a consumer product, like a soccer ball uh, or a water bottle or a hammer, and you ask them, how does this behave? They'll be able to describe it in, in kind of everyday terms, like a hammer needs to be hard and strong and the handle needs to be stiff. Uh, a water bottle might need to be pro uh, cheap uh, and optically transparent or clear so we can see the contents. Um, so we thought, let's get students thinking about everyday consumer products in similar ways that ancient civilizations might have thought of materials, not from a atoms and ions and molecules and microstructure and then building that up uh, around some theory, but really looking at the practical use, um, uh, how things were, were intended to function, um, and, and really kind of uh, everyday observations of, of materials. So it works actually really well to start with a physical object and then imagine an ancient society and an ancient counterpart to that water bottle or to that, that, that soccer ball. And I think you just described our first day of class. We basically begin the entire course by saying to the students, welcome to our class. We'd love to have you here for the semester. Here is a table with a pile of objects. I was about to say a pile of junk because <laughs> they're often very cheap objects. And we say, which one looks interesting to you from a material standpoint, from a societal standpoint? Let's take a look at that object. Let's pick a counterpart to it in the ancient society, all on the first day of class. Well, for what type of uh, learning do you think project-based learning um, would be would find its best applications or strengths? Mm -hmm. And for what type of learning would perhaps uh, project-based learning not be the best method? I might handle the second part of the, the question first. Um, so we've studied project-based learning and other types of active learning, um, both from a, I guess from a theoretical or a research perspective, but also uh, through our own measurements in class and observations. And, and what I think you'll find is that if, if you are very concerned as an instructor that every one of your students learns, um, uh, uh, gains a certain amount of knowledge in a particular domain. So at the end of the class, a student will leave the class and will have seen uh, a, a list of topics that looks a particular way and is f familiar with certain terminology, um, maybe familiar with, uh, with a specific list of theories, um, maybe able to do a, a specific list of, of measurements if you're in a lab class. Um, if you're looking for everyone in the class to have a common experience around a certain theory uh, and certain content and certain knowledge acquisition, then 
approaching project-based learning as we approach it, which is allowing students to choose different objects and explore different paths, might not give you the learning outcomes that you want. It's funny. I was about to answer the flip side of the question, the strengths of project-based learning, and it really goes along with what John just said. I, th I think it's the other side of what you mm -hmm. said. A project is just a natural opportunity for a student to look at a challenge of some sort, perhaps even an opportunity, and on their own to decide, how do I go about doing this? Which tools should I use? In which order should I use these techniques? Um, how do I parcel? How do I divide up the work? There's a lot of choices. This is a, a real world opportunity. This is what students do when they graduate. They're solving problems. The problem usually doesn't take the form of a multiple choice question. It's mm -hmm. something where there's, there's not a clear answer. There's not a clear technique. And so the student is drawing from different, perhaps different disciplines even in our case, but mm -hmm. not always, perhaps just using different techniques to solve this problem and they're making mistakes and then they have to recover from those mistakes. So where you have an opportunity to get, let students really dive into a problem and try different things and on their own assess which ones are working and which aren't working, that's where a project gives you invaluable experience. That's, I would say that's the best opportunity. I gather project-based learning is uh, uh, part of a larger category um, categorizes uh, inductive learning method as an inductive learning method. Sure. How does project-based learning, how could you con compare and contrast project-based learning with problem-based learning? Oh, yeah, uh, that's a great question. It, we, we get this question a lot, actually. Um, I think if you, if you look at the history of problem-based learning, problem-based learning uh, um, started, what, 30, 30 plus years ago? and really kind of uh, came out of uh, uh, medical education. Um, and it was, a, it was a shift from a very kind of theory-based, uh, content-based approach to much more of uh, open-ended problem solving. But if you look at the way that problem-based learning is, is uh, defined um, usually today, um, it involves a lot of thought on the part of the instructor in defining the initial problem. So the instructor thinks very long and hard about what type of problem is the right kind of problem. And the right kind of problem in problem-based learning is usually one that allows students to gain a specific set of knowledge and a specific set of skills. They might take different paths in getting there. Uh, it might be sort of a meandering path, but the instructor knows that the students working on this problem need to kind of hit certain key points along the way. And usually, I think, although this isn't always the case, in problem-based learning, the instructor kind of knows where people are going to end up uh, at, the end of the, at the end of the day or the end of the semester or the end of the experience. So you've, uh, many people have heard the um, a description of instructors as a sage on the stage, um, someone who stands up and professes and knows a lot of things, an expert, uh, compared to a guide on the side. I think problem-based learning is very much the guide on the side approach, where a guide kind of knows where you're going to end up at the end of the day. Uh, Project-based learning, on the other hand, so that's problem-based learning. Project-based learning, oftentimes we have no idea where people are going to end up and what they're going to learn along the way. Um, although you can scaffold or structure projects or constrain them in such a way that they hit certain points, oftentimes students will start a project that we don't have the answer to. And so it's, in that sense, it can be very authentic. Yes, it's interesting because we're talking about a project the process is one of the most important aspects, right? You're going through a process of learning from your mistakes, from your successes, maybe redefining the objectives to some degree as you're proceeding forward. That's the strength of a project, as we were mentioning before. A problem-based learning set, you could structure it, as John said, in a way where you know you're going to have to cover some or perhaps all of an amount of content in an area. You could really design a problem in a way to make, as a teacher, you could design it to give you confidence your students will encounter something. So if that's your learning objective, that could be a powerful tool. Um, I have a friend at, at uh, Bucknell who um, describes projects and his interaction with students in this way. Um, he says, students come to him oftentimes in a project and they ask him, can you help us or do you know the answer to this? And he'll respond, honestly, no, I don't know. And they'll look at him like he's crazy. They'll say, well, what do you mean? You're the instructor, you're the expert you're supposed to know. And his response is, well, you're going to leave college someday and you're going to get a job. Your boss is not going to pay you to solve problems for which he already has the answer. You're going to be solving problems for which nobody has the answer. That's what project-based learning is like. 
Can I persuade you to uh, give us a brief uh, how to design a project-based project learning project in three or four easy steps? Wow. <laughs> that is, that is a all? challenge. A how-to. Yeah, right. <laughs> a very quick how-to. I, I, I don't want to say for dummies. Yeah. I'll just, I'll just say in three or four easy steps. Now we can look to so, our framework. I, I, I would say so. We, we have thought about certain aspects of project design as, as an instructor. Um, I like to think of starting in general with the idea of the goals, the learning objectives of the project, right? So you might consider as a first step saying, what is the disciplinary learning objective? What are, as an instructor, what do I see as some important learning objectives? There are so many potentials, and part of the goal here is to say, I can't do everything. Could you give us three or four learning object object objectives? Potential learning objectives of a project. You could talk about building critical thinking skills. That's, that's, that's a good one. Uh, we talked about content mastery a moment ago. Teaming and collaboration. We want students to be good teammates at the end of the project. Or the development of communication skills, oral communication, written, graphical. Or we want them to have a uh, real world connection, maybe connect with a company or a community or some uh, nonprofit organization uh, in the project. That's right. And we could go on, right? But there's, there's a number of possible goals. And as I said, if you try to attempt too many of these things, your project ends up being confusing or unrealistically, you know, doable. It just can't be completed. So it's an idea of prioritizing, saying, what is this project really about? Mm -hmm. So that's, that's a reasonable starting point. Uh, we like to move from goals then to asking the question, what are students doing during class time and out of class time to make progress toward those goals? And if you pick a more, uh, I guess a more uh, typical goal like content learning, the answer might be pretty easy. They might be doing some readings and working on some problems, maybe taking some exams so you can test their, their knowledge. But if you state a goal like, we want them to be good teammates, um, what does that mean in terms of an activity in class? Or we want them to uh, be able to integrate across disciplines. That might send you down a very different path in terms of the types of activities that students would engage uh, in in the class. So think of all the activities that could potentially lead to that goal, and then try to, through some selection process, identify what would be what's right for my context for what I'm trying to do, for my students, and for my environment, um, and, uh, and then try to narrow down your list of activities. But always keeping in mind that they have to lead to the goals that you pick. That's critical. A lot of instructors, I think, have in mind a few activities when they're planning, when they're just envisioning a course. You just say, oh, I could imagine a very interesting presentation that will take place. Mm -hmm. And it's nice to say, okay, which of my goals would that achieve? Is mm -hmm. that really something I should include? Or would you rather send your students to a museum or have them go to a, a, a local company and start interacting there? Uh, go to the stock market um, and, uh, and get a feel for that. And what goals could those lead uh, students to that, that they might not get to by working problem sets or doing readings out of textbooks? Absolutely. So assuming that you have an instructor who has designed some learning goals that make sense, that are achievable, and lined up some course activities that will help deliver those learning goals, the next step is to think about what will the students be producing? What are the production of the students, the outcomes that are going to be handed in by the students? So again, there are many existing um, outcomes. You could just imagine writing reports. You could imagine a test as an outcome. You could fill out an exam, submit answers to questions. However, there's a lot of possible, out uh, possible objectives, um, what do we say, products that would be produced right, as a result of this. So if you're thinking of your activities, you could think um, if we're going to a museum, one possible activity could be a videoed lecture. Right, The student can give a talk within the museum. That's something they would produce. They would have to do a good job planning this. Uh, and again, you want to con con connect these products both to the activities and to the learning objectives. Again, you're trying to keep everything coherent at this stage. If you're working with a goal such as design, uh, I want my students to be creative designers, you might have a series of activities that lead to them to the production of some prototype, some physical artifact that they can look at and show to other people or test in some way. That's right. And then so after you think about the products or what's coming out of the activities, you have to think about what are we doing with those? How are we evaluating them? How are students getting feedback so that they know whether or not they're making progress toward the goals that you specified? And you can ask all kinds of questions about assessments. Um, uh, hopefully that gets you out of thinking that the right assessment is always an examination. Um, so uh, things like uh, presenting in front of a panel of experts. That's a good um, question. Who is assessing? Yeah, so who is assessing? Question. Why are they assessing? 
Um, and, um, and what's the purpose of it? Is it to just to provide feedback so that students will get better? Is it for the grade? Is it some combination of the two? So um, there's a, you can imagine assessments that, that, uh, um, that cover a, a broad range of activities. Um, I mentioned uh, rocket, pitch, uh, rocket pitches in front of a panel of experts. Sure. Um, you see in architecture, people build physical uh, prototypes and put them out on the lawn for the entire community to look at and provide feedback. Um, uh, websites we've had yep. our students websites made, YouTube pages. videos or something a student could could produce a, a publication and submit it for review by uh, by some journal yeah. um, just, write, you know, write a newspaper editorial right you now there's just there's just so many ways you could take this mm -hmm. peer evaluations self evaluations um, really the the it's it's a it's a long list and we encourage people to get creative with how with how they think about assessing or evaluating students John and Rob very informative thank you thank, thank you so much